Mr. Speaker, I've always been interested in origins. Even though my training is in the law and in history, it has uh, ever been an avocation of mine to contemplate and to study uh, the origins of man and of life here on Earth. Then why haven't you ever done that? And many theories of origins have been propounded throughout our nation's history. No, Mr. Pence. In the entirety of our nation's history, only one theory has ever been propounded regarding the origin of man. Regarding the origin of life, there is as yet no theory. Instead, what we have is a collection of connected hypotheses of endosymbiosis and abiogenesis, and almost all of these hypotheses could be true at the same time and could all be contributors to the multiple methods by which life evidently arose. But thus far, none of them meet the minimum criteria required to qualify as a scientific theory. 1859, a sincere biologist returned from the Galapagos Islands and wrote a book entitled The Origins of Species, in which uh, he did then, Charles Darwin, offered a theory uh, of the origin of species, which we've come to know as evolution. But Charles Darwin never thought of evolution as anything other than a theory. He hoped that someday it would be proven by the fossil record, but did not live to see that, nor have we. Wrong, Mr. Pence. First of all, scientific theories are not what you think they are. They're not blind guesses or conjecture. A scientific theory is a body of knowledge explaining a particular phenomenon. It is possible to disprove a theory, though I don't think that's happened in a hundred years or more, but science will never declare a scientific theory to be proven in the positive sense. You might think the theory of gravity has been proven, but in fact Newton's theory of gravity was replaced by Einstein's theory of relativity because the theory of gravity is wrong. Think about that. Relativity has been positively proven in a colloquial sense a couple of times since then, with the recent discovery of gravity waves and previously in 1919 with the solar eclipse that made Einstein famous. But scientists still won't refer to relativity as a proven theory because the concept is nonsense. You can't prove a field of study, nor an explanation either. That's against the rules. You can only show that it is consistently demonstrably correct and that it has never been disproved. We can say the same thing about evolution. It too is consistently demonstrably correct and has never been disproved. The theory of evolution has been effectively proven too in the same colloquial sense as has relativity, except that evolution has been proved many times over, many different ways, and Darwin did live to see that. Darwin studied paleontology. He noticed that although extinct species were different than anything still alive today, there were fundamental similarities connecting them to distantly related groups in a sort of family tree of all living things. So he predicted that if his theory was correct, and only if his theory was correct, then scientists should find transitional species in the fossil record. And since then, scientists have found hundreds and hundreds of them with some of those lineages essentially complete. Darwin predicted the first of these specifically. He recognized that the wings of modern birds looked like they had been once the hands of dinosaurs, but that their fingers had been fused together. So he predicted that if that is the case, and how could it not be, then there should be a bird found in the fossil record with unfused wing fingers. Just two years later, his hypothesis was proven correct when scientists found exactly that. Archaeopteryx lithographica, a feathered dinosaur, popularly considered to be one of the first birds, vindicated Darwin's theory in his own lifetime. Now, while the fossil record has offered much more proof of evolution since then, we find even more in other fields of study, such as embryological development or phylogenetics, which is as conclusive as anyone could hope for, as well as systematic taxonomy, which offered the first evidence of evolution and could have sufficiently proven evolution even if we'd never found a single fossil. 1925, in the famous Scopes Monkey trial, this theory made its way through litigation into the classrooms of America, and we all have seen the consequence over the last 77 years. Wrong again. It was then illegal to teach evolution in school, and the ruling of the Scopes trial upheld that, such that it was still illegal to teach evolution, at least in Tennessee. However, transcripts of that trial did raise public awareness of how ridiculous creationism is by comparison to evolution. And this comparison came to a head in 1987, when the Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional to teach creationism because it was not scientific in any sense. This was 10 years after you graduated high school, so it was too late to help you. 
I'm sure you've been trained to deny reality as a result of your religious indoctrination, and that's why you resist education. I don't know what consequences you think there are to teaching evolution, but I think the fact that you never learned it yourself, nor apparently any other aspect of science either, better explains why you would imagine a reversal of the trends we really see and then blame that on the straw man of equally imagined causes rather than understand the reality. Evolution not taught as a sincere theory of biologists, but rather, Mr. Speaker, taught as fact. A fact is a point of data that is either not in dispute or is indisputable in that it is objectively verifiable, and that certainly applies to evolution. There are many facts we can teach about evolution, things we can prove to be true of evolution, but there's not one fact anyone can honestly claim in favor of creationism. There is no truth you could show for any religious belief. But we can prove and have already proved the origin of new species through macroevolution, which has been repeatedly directly observed and documented both in the lab and in naturally controlled conditions in the field. So we have to teach evolution as fact because that's what it has been proven to be. According to the National Academy of Science, evolution is both a fact and a theory, and the same could be said of cell theory, atomic theory, and even the theory of gravity. Every modern scientific theory is also a fact. Unless anyone listening in would doubt that, we can all see in our mind's eye that grade room classroom we all grew up in with the linear depiction of evolution just above the chalkboard. There's the little monkey crawling on the grass. There's the Neanderthal with his knuckles dragging. And then there's Mel Gibson standing in all of his glory. It is what we have been taught that man proceeded and evolved along linear lines. Rudy Zellinger's painting called The March of Progress was a fine illustration, and the linear format was well suited for classroom presentation, but the problem with it is that it is linear. It doesn't show the branches of the human family tree. Neanderthals, for example, were never considered to be part of our linear lineage. They're more like the older brothers of Homo sapiens, and they didn't drag their knuckles on the ground either. In fact, none of our ancestors did that. If you look at the lesser apes, they were already fully bipedal. Australopiths didn't drag their knuckles either, but we didn't know that back then. This image was commissioned in the mid-1960s, roughly a decade before the famous missing link was finally discovered, and it is already hard to tell where there could be a link still missing. The thing is, we didn't find just one of them, but dozens, as well as another 50 or so species outside of the hominin tribe, that is the human family tree. And that's the way it has to be represented, as a tree. And consequently, paleoanthropologists have been criticizing the Zalinger painting for at least 40 years now. Importantly, though, each of these individuals depicted our monkeys, not just the first one. We humans are still a subset of old world monkeys. And importantly, all of these actually existed. We found every one of these in the fossil record. This lineage actually branches into four or more different lineages from a common source instead of just one line, but it is still real. The only reason any of these should exist is because evolution is true, and none of these would exist otherwise. But now comes a new find by paleontologists in the newspapers all across America. A new study in Nature magazine. Six to seven million year old skull has been unearthed, the Torme skull, and it suggests that human evolution was actually, according to a new theory, human evolution that was taking place, and I'm quoting now, all across Africa and on the earth, and the earth was once truly, and I quote, a planet of the apes on which nature was experimenting with many human-like creatures. That's not a new theory, and the article didn't say it was a new theory either. That's Darwin's original theory. Evolution was always an explanation of biodiversity, explaining how one species becomes two, and then four, and eight, and so on, with only some of them going extinct while the others continue to diversify. The only new thing is that no one expected there would be so many different humanoids around at the same time. And remember that none of them would exist if creationism was true. This is one of many facts that only evolution can account for and that creationism has to ignore. In this case, the Tumai skull was one where paleoanthropologists can't tell if it's a human ancestor or possibly an ancestor of another of the apes we have today. It is significant that we have so many fossil hominids indicating natural selection rather than a divine orchestration, which would have derived only one lineage, such as Zalinger depicted. Paleontologists are excited about this, Mr. Speaker, but no one's pointing out that the textbooks, I guess, will need to be changed because the old 
theory of evolution taught for 77 years in the classrooms of America as fact is suddenly replaced by a new theory, or I hasten to add, I'm sure we'll be told, a new fact. The textbooks will not have to be changed, although they should be updated to include these newly discovered facts. The facts that are already in the textbooks are still facts, and it is still the same theory, except that now it is even stronger than it was back when you refused to learn it. Well, the truth is, it always was a theory, Mr. Speaker. And now that we've recognized evolution as a theory, uh, I would simply and humbly ask, uh, can we teach it as such? Okay, but the first lesson should be what a theory is. If you could prove a theory, it would not become a law. Theories are more than mere laws. Natural laws are just observations phrased either as mathematic equations or as short statements that are consistently true under specific circumstances. Theories account for or explain natural laws. So the various laws of gravity, of which there are a few, are contained within the overarching theory of gravity. Get it? And likewise, proving a theory wouldn't make it a fact either, although hypotheses do have to be considered factual in order to graduate to the level of theory. Take, for example, atomic theory or the germ theory of disease. There is no doubt that both of these are certainly factual. Same with evolution. Maybe you can think of a theory as what happens when a hypothesis is effectively proven, because now modern science requires that level of confidence in order to graduate to the level of theory. There is no level higher than that. Theories include and envelop natural laws, testable hypotheses, and of course objectively verifiable facts, and are the body of knowledge explaining all these things within their particular field of study. And can we also consider teaching other theories of the origin of species? There aren't any. Evolution is the only theory of biodiversity there is or ever was. It's like the theory that was believed in by every signer of the Declaration of Independence. Every signer of the Declaration of Independence believed that men and women were created and were endowed by that same creator with certain unalienable rights. Before the days of scientific understanding, people believed in mysticism, even some of the smart ones. Many of the signers of the Declaration of Independence believed in phlogiston and vitalism, both of which were disproved in the 19th century. Do you want to drag science education back to the 1700s? The Bible tells us that God created man in his own image, male and female, he created them, and I believe that. And then you're a fool one who too readily believes improbable claims from questionable sources on insufficient evidence, or one who believes completely something written or said by another without question, without reservation, or without reason. The Bible is a man-made compilation of mythology, of adapted fables from previous polytheism, and every testable claim the Bible made has been disproved. I believe that God created the known universe, the earth, and everything in it, including man. And I also believe that someday scientists will come to see that only the theory of intelligent design provides even a remotely rational explanation for the known universe. You said this in 2002, just three years before the Kitzmiller versus Dover trial, which proved that intelligent design meets exactly none of the criteria required of a scientific theory. It's not a theory at all, but rather religion wearing a lab coat in an attempt to disguise itself to evade the law for a deliberately dishonest purpose. Its every claim has either already been disproved or is an unwarranted assumption that isn't supported and isn't testable either, being the very definition of irrational. And it was shown that it has not been able to provide any explanation for anything. Hopefully, a decade after that trial, you're not still spouting the same nonsense, right? But until that day comes, and I have no fear of science, I believe that the more we study the science, the more the truths of faith will become apparent. The truth of faith is that there is no truth to it. Faith is an autodeceptive delusion and the most dishonest position it is possible to have. Faith is not and does not like the truth. I just would humbly ask, as new theories of evolution find their ways into the newspapers and into the textbooks, let us demand that educators around America teach evolution not as fact, but as theory. So you want teachers to mislead their students, 
to misrepresent the science and misdefine theories and facts and to pretend that there was ever a newer theory of evolution than we already have. There was another older theory of evolution before this one called Lamarckism, but Darwin's theory replaced that and there has never been another newer theory to replace Darwin's, though we have included some new things that we learn and add to the sum of knowledge on that subject. But let's also bring into the minds of all of our children all of the theories about the unknowable that some bright day in the future, through science and perhaps through faith, we will find the truth of from whence we come. Faith offers no way to discover the truth about anything, but it's a great way to stay wrong forever and never know it. The truth is what the facts are, what we can show to be true. In which case, evolution is an inescapable fact of population genetics. The Bible is absolutely wrong about absolutely everything. You're an ape and there evidently is no God. Those are the facts. I weep for my country that someone as willfully ignorant, scientifically stupid, and bigoted as you could get so close to ruling and ruining everything this once secular country stood for. In this election, I'm hoping for a grassroots replacement of you and everyone else like you at every level of government.